Okay, so this is part three of our current event in Bible studies for August 26, 2007. And we're going to continue with the teaching today. Uh, this is uh, going to be in reference to Romans 13. And unlimited, the, the title of the message would be Romans 13, an unlimited subservience to government. Where should a Bible-believing Christian draw the line? Okay. Now, this article is particularly by Chuck Baldwin, Pastor Chuck Baldwin. Now, again, one thing he totally leaves out is the 501c3 connection in all of this and how that has so set up the government to come in and dictate and mandate. You know, they're basically telling you what you preach now. You know, and by law they have that right because of the of, because of the corporate agreement that you entered into. A lot of preachers around the country are finding this out. They preach on homosexuality. They preach on political issues. According to the IRS, to, as to not have their tax exempt status revoked, they shouldn't be doing this. That's just a couple things. So Pastor Jeff Baldwin says it seems that every time someone such as myself attempts to encourage our Christian brothers and sisters to resist an unconstitutional or otherwise reprehensible government policy, we hear the retort. What about Romans chapter 13? We Christians must submit to government, any government, read your Bible and leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty much right there. You know, it's like, don't confuse me with the facts, my, mind's are ma my mind is made up. So, or, or, in other words, or words to that effect, no doubt, some who use this argument are sincere. Well, so are the Muslims. They're very sincere. You know, but sincerely wrong. Zeal without knowledge. No. They are only repeating what they have heard their pastor and other religious leaders say. On the other hand, let's be honest enough to admit that some who use this argument are just plain lazy, apathetic, and indifferent. There we go. Yeah. And Romans 13 is their escape from responsibility. Oh, wow. I think he's exactly right. I suspect this is the much larger group, by the way. Nevertheless, for the benefit of those who are sincere and obviously misinformed, let's briefly look at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Okay. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Again, as we're reading this, think about Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, and really what we're living in right now, which is like pre-Nazi Germany. So just bear that in mind, okay? This is a come let us reason together, say of the Lord passage, okay? This is a rightly dividing the word of truth passage. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. Now, if that's all we had to go by, I'd say, whoa, oh, man, I don't know, you know. I don't have enough to go on here. But hold on, what does verse 3 says? For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Well, now, hold on. What we've just talked about today is the exact opposite of that exact scenario that the Bible just laid out in verse 3. We're talking about a government that's a terror to good works, and that is promoting evil works. Well, in other words, for God to recognize a government as a government of God, they must be a terror to good works. They, or, or they must not be a terror to good works. Isn't that what we can infer from verse 3? But this government should be a terror to evil. Now, there was a time in this government where that was probably the case. But it's not anymore, unfortunately. And the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet and put light for darkness and darkness for light. That's what we have here. Will thou, will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. Well, what would be doing that was good? Following the Bible would be the highest good that you could do. But hold on. A lot of the stuff that we've mentioned today is against the Bible. Incorporating your church. Being total subservience to the government. What if the government tells you to go out and chop people's heads off? What if the government tells you to turn, turn your Christian friends in? What if the government says you all have to be forced vaccinated with you? What if the government says you have, you're going to be pulled out of your house and you're going to be put in concentration camps? What if the government tells you to do thing after thing after thing that is totally against the Bible? Is that a good thing? But it says, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. What if we already do, are doing that which was good? 
Well, doesn't good and evil kind of rub each other the wrong way? This is why we're getting all of this resistance and why we're having to talk about all of this stuff because people that want to do right, according to the Bible, are going to increasingly conflict with the evil powers that are in office right now. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But what, is it, what if he's a minister of Satan? And this is what we have in this country. Ministers of Satan. How can we call this present day administration and what's going on and all the things we talked about a minister of God? How can we make that leap of logic? For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Well absolutely. Fear of God. Are you doing that which was evil? Now, I'm not saying you, can't, you can go out now and do something evil and not be brought to justice in the United States like you go out and kill somebody. Yes, it hasn't degraded to the point where there's no justice left. But I'm talking about with a Christian in his Bible. And he's doing that which is right according to the Bible. Okay, And the government is coming over here and telling these 501c3 churches, no, you can't preach on that. You can't do that. No, we're going to use you pastors as this mouthpiece for us. In fact, we're going to use you to quell the scent. We're going to use you to placate the sheep. We're going to use this Romans chapter 13. And another thing, why, I mean, they're using this verse and the government's telling them to preach this. Total subservience to government without question. Where do we draw the line? I can tell you where we draw the line. We, we draw the line when it conflicts with the word of God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, as Joshua said. It is better to obey God than man. So that's a real simple way you can figure out if the government is doing something evil or if it's doing something good. Whenever they're doing something that contradicts the word of God, count it as evil. Sin is sin, God is black and white, period. And we've talked about a lot of evil stuff today in, in a lot of the other lessons. I think it's very simple to see. If thou will do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, now, again, how is he a minister of God if he's doing evil? How does that work? For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. But what if you're doing good? I mean, you could just, 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 just read this with a little bit of common sense, and you can see that this is not in reference to our current, what we currently have uh, dealing with right now. And again, I'm not saying there's no justice at all left. But it's going to come to a point where Satan is going to bear his teeth through this modern day government that we have set up. And we've already looked at this. The concentration camps, the, the forced vaccinations, the forced relocation. That's when Caesar's really going to call on the chips. That's when Satan's really going to bear his teeth. And then the gloves are going to totally come off at that point. Verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Well, if the Holy Spirit lives inside you, and you know the Bible, you know how like when you sin and the Holy Spirit lives inside you, now you get conviction of sin? Well, doesn't that same conviction go over to if the government or, or, some, or some corporate entity, like a 501c3 church, is telling you to do something that's against Scripture? Doesn't your conscience convict you that that's wrong? Well, your conscience should have a part in this, as long as your conscience is lining up with the word of God. For this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Well, if it's a godly government, they're God's ministers. But if it's a government that's doing evil, how could this apply to them? Render therefore all their dues, tribute to whom tribute, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. How can you honor some government that doesn't honor God at all? How can you honor some government that's taken prayer out of school, legalized abortion, done all these things, promoting the homosexual movement, promoting Planned Parenthood, promoting 4,000 abortions a day, promoting forced vaccination, vaccinating, promoting the pharmaceutical companies that put aborted babies in the vaccines, that grow, that grow a lot of their cultures off aborted babies, I mean, you could go on and on and on and on. And how could you say that that is a good, wonderful government? How can we make that leap of logic? 
from a biblical standpoint. Do our Christian friends who use these verses to teach us that we should not oppose President Bush or any other political leader really believe that civil magistrates have unlimited power or authority to do anything they want without oppression? I doubt whether they truly believe that, but that's how these people act. These judges, they're so out of control. Black-robed devils. For example, what if our president decided to resurrect the old monarchical custom of jus prime noctis, which is called the law of first night? What if he decided to do this? That was the old medieval custom when the king claimed the right to sleep with the subject's bride on the first night of their marriage. Boy, that would kind of throw a wet blanket on things, don't you think? Get married? I do. You promise to love and behold I do. You can now kiss the bride. Huh, honey, okay, I kiss you. And then you got the king right there and taking your, your bride away. He's going to go sleep with her first night. Oh, that's not an abomination in the sight of God. That's, that's not an evil thing, right? Well, it's, it's the government. It, it, we have to go along with it because it's, 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 in, it's mandated in law. Where do we draw the line? Let's, let's be reasonable here. Would our sincere Christian brethren sheepishly say, Romans 13 says we must obey our government? I think not. And would any of us respect any man who would submit to such a law? So, so there are no limits to authority. A father has authority in his home. But does this give him power to abuse his wife and children? Of course not. An employer has authority on the job, but does this give him power to control the private lives of the employees? No. See, these are great, great analogies. That's why I wanted to read this. A pastor has overseer authority of his church, but does this give him the power to tell the employers in the church how to run their businesses? Well, I mean, if they're, if they're not in accordance with the Lord, yeah, it would, but... All human authority is limited in nature. No man has unlimited authority over the lives of other men. Lordship and sovereignty is extended exclusively to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ as a born-again Christian. Okay, how do we know that? We know it through his word. Okay. By the same token, a civil magistrate has authority in civil matters, but his authority is limited and defined. Observe Romans chapter 13 clearly limits the authority of civil government by strictly defining its purpose. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, but to the evil, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. He is the minister of God, a revenger to, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see the, you see the, the uh, common thread here? He's only a minister of God if, he is, if he's executing wrath upon evil. I mean, how can he be a minister of God and he's executing wrath upon those that do good? The word of God cannot contradict itself, and God is not the author of confusion. Notice that civil government must not be a tear to good works. It has no power or authority to terrorize good works or good people. But that's the very thing that's happening here. Isn't that what we've just talked about today, and in so many other teachings? God never gave it that authority. And any government that oversteps that divine boundary has no divine authority or protection. They've disqualified themselves, in other words. Through the word of God, civil government is a minister of God to thee for good. Or, uh, quote, civil government is, is a, quote, minister of God to thee for good. It is not a minister of God for evil, but see, unfortunately, that's what it's become. Civil government can become a minister of Satan to do evil. It can, it can do either. Okay? But, the, but the civil government that's in reference here is very, very specific and defined as a minister of God for thee for good. Civil magistrates have a divine duty to, quote, execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. They have no authority to execute, execute wrath upon him that doeth good. None. Zilch. Zero. And anyone who says they do is lying. So even in the midst of telling Christians to submit to civil authority, Romans chapter 13 limits the power and specifically defines the, the, this whole scope. It limits the power and reaches of civil authority. Did Moses violate God's principle of submission to authority when he killed the Egyptian taskmaster in defense of his fellow Hebrew? What would probably be even a better example was, was when, Romans, was when um, Moses basically you know, went against Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the law of the land. Was, was, was Moses in, uh, I guess he wasn't in God's will because he went against civil authority. 
Did Elijah violate God's principle of submission to authority when he openly challenged Ahab and Jezebel, who were ruling the land at that time? Did David violate God's principle of submission to authority when he refused to surrender to Saul's troops, who was in authority at the time? Did Daniel violate God's principle of submission to authority when he obeyed the king's law to not pray audibly to God? Huh? Well, he threw him in the, you know, the whole thing there. Did the three Hebrew children violate God's principle of submission to authority when they refused to bow to the image of the state? Did John the Baptist violate God's principle of submission to authority when he publicly scolded King Herod for his infidelity? Did Simon Peter and the other apostles violate God's principle of submission to authority when they refused to stop preaching in the streets of Jerusalem? Acts 5.29 says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that's all we're talking about here. Man-made laws that have been enacted, particularly through Clinton and Bush, these executive orders, they have no basis in Scripture. These, these, these executive orders and all these, these draconian evil things, they have no basis in Scripture. In fact, they're against Scripture. That makes them evil. Did Paul violate God's principle of submission of, uh, of authority when he refused to obey those authorities who demanded that he abandon his missionary work? In fact, Paul spent much of his time in jail as he did out of jail. <laughs> Remember that every apostle of Christ except John was killed by hostile civil authorities opposed to their endeavors. Christians throughout church history were imprisoned, tortured, or killed by civil authorities of all stripes for refusing to submit to their various laws and prohibitions. Did all of these Christian martyrs violate God's principle of submission to authority? What about Jesus Christ? I mean, wasn't that a very, very similar issue there? So even the great prophets, apostles, and, and the writers of the Bible and the writers of Romans chapter 13, think about that, Paul, so even the great prophets, apostles, and writers of the Bible, including the writer of Romans chapter 13, understood that human authority, even civil authority, is limited. Paul wrote Romans chapter 13, and yet he spent most of his life in jail. Think about that one a little bit. Plus, Paul makes it clear that our submission to civil authority must be predicated on more than fear of governmental retaliation. Notice he said, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Meaning, our obedience to civil authority is more than just because they said so. It is also a matter of conscience. This means that we must think and reason for ourselves regarding the greatness, re regarding the justice and the righteousness of our government laws. Okay, so then it says, Obedience is not automatic or robotic. It is a result of both rational deliberation, moral approbation, but, most, but primarily obedience should be based on the Word of God. So why it's very important what Bible version you're reading. Because if you're reading some perverted version like an NIV, which has removed 64,098 words to be exact, how do you even know you're getting the full word of it? They've removed whole verses there. So going back to this, it says, Therefore, there are times when civil authority may, may need to be resisted. Either governmental abuse of power or the violation of conscience or both could precipitate civil disobedience. Of course, how and when we decide to resist civil authority is an entirely separate issue. And I will reserve that discussion for another time. Beyond that, we in the United States of America do not live under a monarchy. We have no king, therefore no single governing authority official in this country. And right now we have a madman at the helm, with a madman henchman as vice president. Okay? America's supreme law does not rest with any man or any group of, of men. America's supreme law does not rest with the president, the Congress. And personally, I think the supreme law as a Christian is the word of God. Now, he goes on to say that America's supreme law, you know, does not rest with president, Congress, Supreme Court. In America, the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. But I still view the Bible as higher than any supreme law of the land. Okay, So that takes, in my estimation, precedent over this. Under our laws, every governing of official publicly promises to submit to the Constitution of the United States. Do readers understand the significance of this distinction? This means that in America, the higher powers 
are not the men who occupy elected office. They are the tenants in principles set forth in the U.S. Constitution under our laws and form of government. It is the duty of every citizen, including our elected officials, to obey the U.S. Constitution. See, so much of what they're enacting right now through these executive orders are against the Constitution. So what do we obey? I mean, they, 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 they can elect any law that they want to do. Don't you think evil men are going to do that? Well, who do we obey? Well, we obey the Bible first and the U.S. Constitution over anything that's going to contradict that. But see, they've thrown out the U.S. Constitution. I told you what George Bush said it was. Dear Christian friend, the above is exactly the proper understanding of our responsibility to civil authority in the United States as per the teaching of Romans chapter 13. And again, this is rightly dividing the word of truth, what we've done today. Furthermore, Christians above all should desire that their elected representatives submit to the Constitution because it, is, because it is the constitutional government that has done more to protect Christian liberty than any other government document ever devised. But I still give that credit to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to give the Constitution or any man or anything else credit for something that the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, gave us. Okay? I, I just, I'm very cautious about that because the Bible says that, you know, I am the Lord God and I will share my glory with no man. So I'm, I'm, I don't think so much of the time when I read these guys, they act as though God is not really a factor, or the Word of God. And I think it's very important, we need to be very careful to always give the Lord the glory for anything good. Because only the Lord's good. The, all good things come from the Lord, period. So we just need to be really careful about that. I don't want to get on the Lord's bad side, to be quite honest with you. What, like the Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. When we read this and we don't mention God, and we act as though the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and don't mention God, well, I think that's an affront to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father God, to the Holy Spirit that would live inside you as a born-again Christian. I just, I don't want to go there. As a result, Christians in America, for the most part, have not had to face the painful decision to obey God rather than men and defy the civil authorities. The problem in America today is that we have allowed our political leaders to violate their oath of office and to ignore and blatantly disobey the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, if we truly believe Romans 13, we will insist and demand that our civil magistrates submit to the U.S. Constitution. Now, how many of us Christians are going to truly obey Romans 13? And again, I'll read this verse from Proverbs. A righteous man... Proverbs 25, 26, a righteous man falling down before the wicked, which is what we're doing. When we obey a wicked governmental mandate that's in clear contradiction to the word of God, it is a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Why would a righteous man fall down before a wicked? Because he fears man more than he fears God. And the fear of man bringeth a snare. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of understanding, of knowledge. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. He will be attentive under their prayers, those that are contrite and meek and fear God. You want God to listen to your prayers? Well, the Bible also says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So don't have sin in your life. doesn't mean you walk around in sinless perfection, but you repent of the sin. Okay? And you are meek and humble before the Lord, and you fear God. And if you don't feel as though you have that within you, pray for the fear of God. Pray for meekness before the Lord. Because that's one of the only things that we can do to please God. Remember, the Bible says, For we are all together as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as a filthy rag in God's eyes. Our best day, done in the flesh, is as a filthy rag in God's eyes. But we can do all things through Christ which strengthen us. And if we're doing it through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that, can be, that will be pleasing to the Lord. And the Lord will get glory through these things. And hopefully many, many men will be saved as a result of what the Holy Spirit is doing through you as a Christian. So these are just things to bear in mind in regard to this whole teaching. That's the end of uh, our teachings for today. And I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord God, for this time that you've given us, Lord. I do pray, God, that you would hide your word in our heart, Lord, that you would forgive us, Lord God, for any and all sins that we've committed in any way, shape, and form, Lord God. 
that you would cleanse us of secret sins and presumptuous sins, that they would not have dominion over us, that the words of our mouth, Lord God, the meditations of our heart, would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Lord God, I just pray that, that for every individual out there, that they have the proper perspective on the teachings that we are going over today, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that, that you would bless them, that you would hide us, Lord God, in the wicked days that are coming, that we would be accounted worthy to escape all the things that are coming upon this world, Lord. Because you're the only one that can protect us, Lord. I pray that you would instill in us the fear of God and not the fear of man. I pray that you would take any fear of man away from us. And that, Lord God, that these things would not discourage us, but would actually inspire us to see that the Bible has come alive. And to know that I believe you're going to use your remnant in a mighty way in these end times that we're moving into. I pray, Lord God, that we would not be deceived as as you've told us to pray. I pray, Lord God, that you would use the body of Christ mightily, that many would be saved as a result of what you're going to do through the body of Christ. And that, Lord God, that your name would be glorified. I pray, Lord God, that you would overthrow and expose the wicked, Lord God. Particularly, Lord God, the evil entities that emanate and operate through these wicked people and these governmental institutions. For you said in your word, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, principalities, rulers of wickedness. I pray, Lord God, you would fight against them that fight against us. That under the covert of thy wings, that we would make our refuge until these calamities be overpassed. In the name of Jesus Christ. For we can do nothing apart from you, and we are nothing apart from you, Lord God. I claim Psalm 64, Lord God, over any and all evil entities that would emanate and operate through these individuals and through these governmental institutions. And I pray to God the wicked be overthrown. And if it be possible, Lord God, their souls would be saved. We claim Psalm 64 over them even now this day. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil manner. They commune of lane snares privily. They say, Who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them in the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded, so they shall make their own tongues to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear, and shall declare the work of God. For they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord, and shall trust in him, and all the upright hearts shall glory. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.